Okay, part two of uh, lessons from the Last Supper. And we're, we're just, if you remember, we were just thinking about Jeremiah 31, 31. Before that, we'd thought about how, what God's people did with the old covenant and that they made a, they made a mess of it. But Jeremiah 31, from verse 31, is what you need to look for next in your Bible. So just pause me there and let's go for Jeremiah 31, verse 31, and I'll read to 34. Okay, welcome back. Let's look at Jeremiah 31, uh, verse 31. And here we have Jeremiah, God's spokesperson, his mouth, God's mouthpiece, and he tells us, a change is coming. A wonderful change is coming. So, Jeremiah 31, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. We just read about this new covenant that Jesus declares at the Last Supper in Luke 22, verse 20. And here in Jeremiah 31, 31, again, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time declares the Lord I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And then what happens? After, after Jeremiah has said all this, what happens? Well, let's go over to John Stott again, who summarises what happens next. After Jeremiah has declared these things, more than, so it's a quote from Stott and the cross of Christ. More than six centuries passed, years of patient waiting and growing expectancy until, until, one evening, in an upper room in Jerusalem, a Galilean peasant, carpenter by trade and preacher by vocation, dared to say, in effect, this new covenant prophesied in Jeremiah is about to be established. The forgiveness of sins promised is about to become available and the sacrifice to seal this covenant and procure this forgiveness will be the shedding of my blood in death. And then Stott concludes, is it possible to exaggerate the staggering nature of this claim? Jesus claims to be the bringer of the new covenant. Jesus claims to be within his body, he, that he is carrying the blood of the new covenant, the blood that is going around his body, pumped by his heart, is the best blood, the blood of the new covenant, to seal in his death that will seal the new agreement with God, so that we might have peace with God, we might be reconciled and be friends and even family with God. So, yes, Jesus' death had a point to it. It was, it was purposeful. Through the cross, God is making the new agreement with people. Back in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, look at verse 33. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And verse 34, for I will forgive their wickedness. And will remember their sins no more. We remember this Last Supper. 
And actually, as we trust in the cross, God, God does a, a great thing where he does not remember. He does not remember. The wonderful thing, as we remember, we have God not remembering our sins. We'll remember their sins no more. So, so far, lesson one, the, the cross is pivotal. Second lesson from the Last Supper, the cross has a point. And the third lesson from the Lord's table, a choice needs to be made. Now, we need a, we need a P here, don't we? So this death needs to become personal for us. The cross is personal. Now, we're going to turn to John 6 from verse 53. So please pause me as you find John 6, John 6, verse 53. Okay, welcome back. John 6, 53. Now, when you read this, it is little wonder why, it's not really a surprise, why some people thought the, the first Christians were cannibals. Some of the Romans, some of the Greeks, they started to, to suspect this new movement out of Judaism was just a bunch of cannibals. Because look at what Jesus says. John six fifty three. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, that's Jesus, Jesus the Son of Man, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... Unless you do that, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. What's that going on about? Now, just, just pause, pause me a sec and just consider... What is Jesus talking about there with all this uh, drinking his blood and eating his flesh? Otherwise, you can't get eternal life. What's that? <clears throat> so, welcome back. What's it going on about? Well, to, to put it simply... We need to be all in with Jesus, trusting in his cross, trusting in his sacrifice. When we take communion, it's not magic, like you take the bread and the wine and somehow you get life. No, you, you got life through trusting wholeheartedly in the Lord Jesus and following in his footsteps as the, and being given the spirit as you became a Christian. But the... Those symbols are a sign that you have that life in you, which leads to eternal life. Jesus guarantees that we live forever with him, even though we die, that we are then raised again and we, we live with him. So a question for you. These verses here, what does it mean for those who do not accept the help Jesus offers from the cross. So if, if we don't take up Jesus' offer that comes from his sacrifice on the cross, uh, what happens? Just pause me there. There's some, an attempted answer. What happens if you don't accept Christ's offer from the cross and what it seems to be? Well, end of verse 53 We've got no life in us. Um, middle of 54, this offer of eternal life is, it won't be ours. Uh, so outside of, outside of Christ, there is no, ultimately no life and then no life eternally with him. The, the blessed, the best life is, is not ours. Uh, so another question, what does it mean if we do accept the help Jesus offers from the cross? Now, I'll, I'll answer this straight away. What, 
what, what if we do accept Jesus' offer and it is, as he points to the cross, we are given life, eternal life. And end of verse 54, he will raise us up at the last day. Now, next, please, please notice this. It is worth pointing out the timing of what Jesus is doing. He is declaring the new covenant on the big day in the calendar year of the old covenant. The old covenant was being celebrated this, this day when the Passover lamb, the lambs were were killed in, in Egypt to provide a, a covering for the people of God so that they could escape Egypt to the promised land. Now to do this, to declare this on the day of the old covenant, to declare the new covenant might be a bit like this. Think about it this way. A bit like standing up on Christmas Day, turkey time, Christmas tree, You've just been to the church in the morning and you stand up in front of all your family and friends and you say, now, you have always celebrated Christmas as the day when Jesus came, the saviour came to the planet. But now I tell you, there is a new Christmas celebration. The old Christmas was always pointing to the new Christmas. Now, here's a question. How would you respond if someone stood up over the top of the turkey and declared that, that they are the new Christmas. The old Christmas was always pointed to the new Christmas. How would you respond? Just pause, pause it there. And welcome back. Well, how would you respond? Someone's saying, oh, the new, the new, I am the new Christmas. I, my response would be, what? Are you, are you mad? Christmas is Christmas. Uh, there is no new Christmas. The difference with Jesus is that the old covenant, as we've just seen in Jeremiah, even in the old covenant, there was the hope of the new covenant. It was expected. The change was coming. And Jesus, perfectly, on the, the day of the old covenant, he was declaring... I am the new covenant. I am the one who brings it in. And I'm going to steal stuff from John Stott here about Jesus being the new Passover. Jesus was dying on the cross at the very time that the Passover lambs were being killed from the old covenant. The Passover lambs are being killed, old covenant. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, is dying on the cross at the same time, on the Friday. The lambs that meant God's people could live and go free and reach the promised land were dying at the same time when Jesus was dying so that we could live and go free and be in that promised land in the future. And Jesus models his Last Supper on the Passover. Like a lot of his sayings are like the Passover sayings. So when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, instead of what it says in the Passover meal. So in the Passover meal, these are the words. It says, if, if you do the Passover meal, it says, this is the bread of affliction, which our fathers had to eat as they came out of Egypt and Jesus points to a, a better bread so that's the end of part two we've had our lessons from the last supper that the cross is pivotal purposeful and personal so part three response what is our response to this well let's respond in prayer and I'll, I'll give you some options where you can pray in the silence or you can pray out loud at home go for it you could go for all three responses and i'm going to go for the teaspoon approach so the tsp thank you sorry please 
prayers you might pray to God. So the first one, you might want to thank God for anything we've just heard. Jeremiah 31, 34. You might want to pray for this new agreement. Jeremiah 31, 34, where it says, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now there is something to thank God for. Well, what about the sorry? You could say sorry, bring your sin to the cross today and ask for God's cleansing, his forgiveness. And also P for please. So with this um, coronavirus around, it can start to fill our thoughts, but really the cross of Christ, Christ himself, is the one who should have the central place in our thoughts. So let's ask for God's help that there'll be one C that is central, and that is Christ and his cross, and that the other C, coronavirus, will not rule our thoughts. So we won't be ruled by the fear of coronavirus, but by our trust in Christ. So take an opportunity now to thank or to say sorry or please. So thank God for this new agreement or sorry for your sin or please may Christ, my trust in him, dominate my thinking and not the coronavirus. So let's pray. Just pause me there. Okay, so we've prayed. Um, now, it's been, it's been great to be with you. I've really enjoyed going through this material. I've been thrilled to think about the cross. I hope, hope you have too. And let me pray to close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for this new agreement where our sins can be dealt with and we can know the sweetness of eternal life with you forever. We praise you today. May our... In all our different situations, may we be able to praise you through the, the good times and through the storms. Some people are going through very difficult times. Lord, may, may they know your goodness despite the situation, through the tough situation. In Jesus' name, amen.